So welcome everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and good night. I am Evelyn Wang, and on behalf of the organizing committee, I would like to welcome you to our second InnoTherm Colloquium. As Professor Gong Chen introduced last week, this colloquium series aims to stimulate and highlight innovations and advances in theory, materials, devices, and systems to effic for efficient thermal energy conversion, storage, transport, and utilization. We had a very inspiring talk from Pro Professor Run Majumdar and three panelists last week. For those that missed it, the webinar is on YouTube and the Q&A are posted online. You can visit our website, which is highlighted here on the bottom, inotherm.mit.edu for the posting and link. As you can see from the slide on the right, we had over 1,400 participants from around the world. The attendees are still pro predominantly from North America, and it is our hope that we can further expand to the international community. So we ask that you help spread the word and forward our announcement to other, others via Zoom link and ask them to sign up for future announcements. You can see from the poll results from also last week, that we had a nice mix from academia, industry, and government, and we hope to continue to attract a diverse audience for this colloquium. And finally, we learned that most of you prefer to have this colloquium every other week. So after this four, first four colloquia, we will change it to biweekly. Today's topic will focus on using the cold universe as a sustainable energy resource. The next two webinar topics are here and hopefully you will join us for those as well. And now I'd like to introduce our moderator for this session, Professor Junichiro Shiomi. Professor Shiomi is a professor and head in the Department of Mechanical Engineering at University of Tokyo in Japan. He is highly regarded in the fields of nanoscale heat transfer, interfacial fluid dynamics, thermoelectrics, materials informatics, and multi-scale computation. So please join me in welcoming Professor Shiomi. Thank you very much, Evelyn. Um, so my name is Junichiro Shiomi, and I'm very happy to be able to moderate uh, this session with a great uh, presenter and also great panelists and great attendees. Um, so I think the organizer of this colloquium has intention to make this activity international. And um, this is one of the reasons why I'm moderating the session. And today it has become truly international. Me from Japan, uh, Professor Rong Weiyan from um, China, and then the rest uh, Professor uh, David Saylor from uh, West Coast U.S. and Professor Yuan Yan from uh, East Coast U.S. So I, sorry, let me share this my screen first. Um, hold on. Okay, thank you. So with that, I would like to introduce you, Professor Rong Wei Yan. He's currently professor at Haozhou University of Science and Technology in Energy and Power Engineering. He was formerly professor at University of Colorado Boulder in Mechanical Engineering and Material Science. And he's well known in research areas, nanoscale heat transfer, phase change heat transfer, radiative cooling, thermal management, and thermal energy storage and many others. Before we move on to his presentation, let me also introduce the panelist of today. Uh, the first panelist is Professor David Saylor. He's currently professor at Arizona State University, <coughs> and also a director of Urban Climate Research Center. He was formerly professor and director of Green Building Research Lab at Portland State University and also professor and director of National Institute of Global Environmental Change, South Central Regional Center at Tulane University. His research areas include urban atmospheric modeling across scales. 
heat mitigation technologies and strategies for cities and building and environment interactions. The other panelist is Professor Yuan Yang. He's currently associate professor at Columbia University in applied physics and applied math mathematics. He was formerly postdoc at MIT in mechanical engineering after he got PhD at Stanford. His research areas include radiative thermal management, advanced battery technologies, including high energy density lithium metal batteries and solid state batteries. So before moving on to Professor Ronguayan's presentation, I'm just gonna go through briefly the agenda of today. After his presentation, we'll move on to intermission poll number one. So we'll be doing a poll. If you attended last time, I guess you know how to do it, but for those who attended to, um, for the first time today, you are, if you're used to Zoom, you might be looking for a chat mode, but we don't have a chat function in this webinar. Instead, you'll be communicating through the Q&A function, okay? So, and also the polls function. So you'll be using this poll for the poll, and then for the questions, you'll be using the Q&A functions. And after the poll, we'll move on to the panel discussion with Professor Yang, Professor Saylor, Professor Yang, and that'll be about 30 to 45 minutes. And then after that, we'll wrap up with another poll, poll number two. So please submit the questions. Questions are a very important part of this colloquium and we'll be doing the discussion based on your questions. And like I said, please use the Q&A button in Zoom and we'll be pulling from the stream. Questions are visible only to the panelists and not to the attendees. And their default is that we'll be, um, we'll be stating your name when, you, when we address your questions, but if you prefer to be anonymous, please state so when you uh, ask questions, okay? Uh, this colloquium will be recorded and will be posted on YouTube later. And this may also include questions which can go, which can get to, which we can get to today, All right? So you can start asking questions anytime from now until the end of the colloquium. All right, with that, I would like to introduce you, or let's move on to the presentation of, by Professor Rong Guiyang. So Professor Yan, the, stage, the screen is all yours. Please start sharing your screen. Is it in now? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening everyone. And uh, thanks to uh, for the nice introduction and uh, thanks the organizers from MIT uh, for organizing this event. And indeed I know Evelyn, Gang and Asher and the others spend a lot of time to put in this event together, especially personally inviting different speakers and a lot of panelists. Thank you so much for your efforts. And I, I realize it's actually truly a challenge to uh, make a talk out of Professor Alun Magenda. Uh, he, he is such a, a charming speaker indeed. And uh, in the meantime, I, I believe we, we do share similar concerns on thermal science. So I'd like to share what I learned over the past five years or so, uh, especially on something called radiative cooling and how like radiative cooling can be used for solving something looks exciting or interesting. And I believe most of us have the same common sense for, and that is to say temperature, right? And if you look into so-called temperature, actually, I want to share a really <coughs> exciting picture or, or eye-catching picture. It's global warming. Right? And uh, on, on top of this slide, you can see so-called annual temperature local records on the Earth. And you can see that there are extreme temperatures all over the Earth and it's changing all the time indeed. 
And uh, every year, if uh, if you listen to the radio or watch TV, and then there is always some report say record high temperature, and that's really global warming. And uh, we know that over the past 50 years or so, actually the temperature keep rising. And uh, right now we are trying to get this rising under two degree by 2050. And this means it's pretty big challenge for many of us, including, including some more scientists like you and me, right? And uh, the scary part of this is we know the sea level is rising and if this keep happening and uh, everybody, including you, me, and uh, even the polar bear are losing their habitats. And uh, we need to look into say what is going on there and how we can make a little bit of efforts try to reduce those. And that's definitely the efforts we as a community is going. And I believe uh, Alun's talk is, is on, on the same page on those. Now, I think uh, human beings are smart. We can move around even, even when we know, say, the sea level is rising or just out of, really just out of the carrier invented uh, air conditioner and we see the street like uh, hotels like this, right? A lot of air conditioners. Unfortunately, this air conditioners makes us cool, but in the meantime, it actually heat up the earth, right? It, the more we cool, actually, the more we heat up the earth. Now, the truth is there are a lot of places like Africa, like India, like Southeast of Asia, they do not have as many air conditioners as they should have, similar to say uh, people in US or in Europe. And uh, in the left bottom corner, I show a picture which shows the need in terms of air conditioner. It's called cooling degree in days means how much is needed in terms of different region. And uh, the ball layer actually shows how big is the population. And you see like Philippines, right? India, right? they need really a lot of cooling degree days. And this all means we need to use a lot of electricity. And it is actually <coughs> predicted a lot by 2050 the world energy consumption for cooling will be tripled. And as I mentioned, the more, the more you cool, actually the more trouble you get into all the earth. And this next slide I show say how the energy production and consumption is now today. And I use US energy consumption as an example. And on this slide, you see the right part, there are something called residential and commercial about 20% of the total energy use is for cooling, heating, and for buildings and the lighting. Okay, among this, actually, pretty big amount is for air conditioners. Now, if you go outside in any of the days on the street, you look at the buildings, and you shoot the window, say, why we need so much energy, electricity for cooling? Right? It's because of the building envelope structure, right? We, we have glass, right? Windows, loops, and uh, walls. And uh, they all basically gain some heat from the sunlight, for example. And if you can change a little bit of the envelope material, you might be able to reduce the cooling requirement. Now, on the other hand, if you see the left side, and this slide usually makes so more engineers like us, really exciting because we feel, feel like a lot of energy we are using essentially are thermal energy. Now there is something unfortunate is about or more than 60% of the heat we burn, the fossil fuels essentially are rejected and it's called waste heat. Right? Now why is something called waste heat? That's something coming from Kernel cycle efficiency or thermodynamics. It really tells you, say, we use, we use atmosphere or we use our Earth's surface, either lakes or just air as a heat sink. And because of the heat sink, keeps around 300K 
and that makes the efficiency not as high. Now, if you can reduce the heat sink temperature or making anything lower temperature than whatever your lake is, you can increase the efficiency of the heat engines and make more electricity out of certain amount of coal, for example. And that would change, would change really say the energy, the, uh, the, the fossil fuel consumption. And of course, make the earth slightly not as hot, right? So, so essentially where we are now is because we live on the earth. Now I want to show you a picture and uh, you can imagine where you are, right? And this is the earth's surface we live in. And because of the earth's surface limits our imagination, our practice is using the so-called ambient or lake, whatever to call this. Now, if you look at this picture, you see where the heat comes to the earth, right? It's from the sun, and the sun shed a lot of visible and near infrared solar light to the earth. Right? In the meantime, the earth is on a very cold universe, it's 3K. In essentially, outer atmosphere, essentially, a vacuum, right? Almost vacuum, and it's only 3K. So all the energy should be balanced from the sun to the earth and to the universe. It's really through thermal radiation. Now, if we're thinking about global warming and uh, thinking about where really is global warming coming from and how you can think about stop it, or just ch think about the changing the earth's temperature, I think, you look at this picture, you can do quite a bit. Either just turn the sun off or just make the, the leak to the, to the universe more through thermal radiation, for example. And that's, that could be a story layer. And now if I look into the next slide, it shows a little bit more in terms of the energy transfer on the Earth, right? The Earth, we have atmosphere and definitely a conduction and a convection through the atmosphere. But in the meantime, I think the most important part, as I mentioned, is the sunlight, thermal radiation to the Earth. And on the Earth, you can think about how to change the Earth's temperature through atmosphere engineering or through Earth engineering. And if you can think about Earth engineering through so-called long wavelength thermal radiation to the space. And that could be something to do. Now, if you look at this, there is one particular electromagnetic wavelength or, or range of electromagnetic wavelengths can shed the heat into the space. And that is called as, as the atmospheric windows. Essentially, it's eight to 13 micron wavelengths IR wave and they can go through the atmosphere, go through the H2O, ozone, carbon dioxide, and directly dissipate the heat to the universe. And that's pretty exciting because you don't need to worry too much about, say, carbon dioxide or anything, because that particular window is very transparent. And you can think about how to get through, okay? and especially the heat dissipating through that window. And something we feel we can do something on it. And uh, this actually is, is, is known for space physics, for Earth physics people for a long time. It's about say thermal radiation from the Earth to the universe or to the cold space. Indeed, by about 2000 and 2017, on a, on, on, on a week, we published our paper in science, and that was a very cold day in, in, in Washington and uh, in New York. And the weather report shows a picture like this. It shows you why we have extreme cold weather. It's really because of radiative cooling. And this is somehow the known phenomenon for, for weather reporters for those guys predicting the weather, okay? And we also know the dews on glass in the morning are cold desert at night. 
It's really because of radiative cooling. Now, people have been thinking about using this nighttime radiative cooling actually for quite many years, especially in 1970s and 80s, usually during the, the days we have, say, oil problems, or gas problems, petroleum problems. And this is actually a building built in Abakuke in 1970s. It's trying to use so-called nighttime radiative cooling to cool uh, the house. Now, also, there are more use, especially for nighttime cooling. Right? And this picture shows people try to use it as a radiator for nighttime radiative cooling and use air or water as a heat transfer of fluids. Essentially, if you can have storage or something, you can utilize that. That's something I wanted to articulate to say people know this phenomena before in terms of nighttime cooling. But there are challenges in daytime cooling, right? And daytime radiative cooling, that is a big challenge, right? Why? It's because of the sun. The sun heats up very badly. And if you look into the sun, the sun has 1,000 watt per meter square energy density on Earth, okay, when you have the sun, right? Now in the meantime, on the right hand side, you see the really about room temperature on the Earth and how the thermal radiation go through the atmospheric window or go through the whole atmosphere, right? Now there is a particular part from eight to 13 micron wavelengths electromagnetic wave, it can go directly through uh, the atmosphere is called atmospheric window, and uh, you can have very good uh, cooling there. Now, to make to make it daytime, so-called subambient cooling, real challenge is try to reflect all the sunlight. In the meantime, you want to make as high as possible the emissivity over that atmospheric window, and that's eight to thirteen micron wavelength. And uh, as far as I talk to, I talk to most of the uh, optical engineering guys, and they feel this is a challenge because optical engineers or electronic en engineers, they do, they control or they do EM wave engineering. And what they did is really on particular wavelengths. And this one we have is called blow band is Spending over orders of magnitude in terms of wavelengths, and this makes a challenge for them indeed. Okay, of course, in the meantime, for us as a heat transfer guys, we know in heat transfer textbook there is something called wavelength selective materials, and this is essentially try to make wavelength selective materials. Okay, now with that challenge being talked, actually, I'm very much in depth to. My colleague, very senior colleague, Professor Xianfei Huang from Stanford, they made very much first demonstration on daytime subambient cooling, and it is called nanophotonic material. What they made is multi layer oxide materials, and you can see all nanometer scale and many layers. The good thing is they show that the sunlight is reflected by. 94% and, uh, and there are just only a few percent of absorption of sunlight on the surface. In the meantime, about 60 or 70% of emissivity over the atmospheric window. And in the end, the result is just outside, okay, just putting a piece of layer material outside and you see the air temperature layer and uh, you touch their surface, it's a 4 degrees C lower than ambient temperature, okay? Before this paper was published, there was nobody ever reported a temperature lower than ambient temperature whenever you put a piece of material outside. And this is very exciting to us, right? This is really is eye-opening for us because usually we go out, we touch anything, it feels hot. And this is the first one, feel cold. Now, the trouble or the challenge is these materials are made of multiple layer oxides and uh, it's, it's reasonably delicate engineering because you see layers, 30 nanometer, 73 nanometer and 34 nanometer. It's engineered structure. It makes it difficult to 
produced in large scale and uh, it could be costly. So we came up with a different approach and that approach is, I believe for meta material, it's quite a change because we made something called random dielectric polymer material. We try to make them basically deployable or make them say can be produced in large scale. And uh, what can you make in terms of really large scale, make many. I think a polymer is one of the solutions. And so that's why we use so-called polymer matrix. This polymer matrix to be transparent to the solar light, okay? And have to be reasonably emissive, okay? But most polymers are emissive in terms of infrared light. Now, the other thing is we use inside this, we use called glass microspheres. And the light resonance of glass microspheres essentially gives us very large emissivity for the atmospheric window for A to 30 micron. In other words, this material has two pieces. One piece is polymer and glass microbeads, and the layer, you make them transparent to sunlight and high emissivity to the atmospheric window. In the meantime, there is a backup coating called metal coating, which reflects sunlight. Okay, we made this material through something called low-to-low -low manufacturing. And here, there is a slide basically shows you that it's very much transparent, but in the meantime, it scatters light, so it's diffusive. Okay. Now, if we back up with silver coating or metallic coating, we end up with something really, bright, really whitish color on the left part. And that's what we have in terms of the metal material. Now, if we check the radiative properties or thermal radiative properties, we can see on the left, basically it reflects almost perfectly the sunlight, 96% sunlight being reflected. And uh, in atmospheric window, A to 30 micron, we have almost perfect emission. Okay, in this figure, we also show say theoretical calculation and the experimental uh, research, it compares reasonably well, especially on the wavelength region we are interested in looking at. Now these are, so something a lot of optical engineers or materials people usually do. We test the thermal performance and uh, we follow actually a thermal testing vehicle as what Stanford did. I think we did a little bit of thermal insulation layer. The key results are shown in this picture. Basically, it shows that during a hot summer day, we can reach about 7.5 degrees C lower temperature than ambient temperature. And in the winter, in the, in the evening, it can be even colder, right? And we also check what's the cooling power. And uh, we use basically the tracing about the temperature. We found out that the cooling power is about say 100 watt per meter square. And that's really 150 watt for, for the infrared window and minus about 40 watt of solar heating. And that gives you about 110 in that region. Now this is really we cool the air. We can see the temperature reduction. In the meantime, if we tell people say, okay, this is cooling, and people will say, okay, that's not too exciting, right? Because people have been using so-called reflecting materials. We also try to insulate things to make them not as hot under the sun. So we, we make an experiment like this one, really a lot of panels with water inside. We try to directly show people we have material better than just reflecting the sunlight, okay? Or better than the so-called well-insulated walls. And you can see here, basically you have ambient temperature and uh, different panels. The best material we have is our surface. You can have about 10 degrees C lower than ambient temperature if you have water inside. Now, if you can cool water, you can make a lot of things. You can cool, use that water to cool, say, air conditioners, right? Because the air conditioner have heat sink layer. 
and you can cool power plants. So we made up, we make a system, and this system called one kilowatt system. Basically, we have these panels, it can cool about one kilowatt, and it's 24 hours continuous cooling. And those are basic materials. Now, over the past few years, after we demonstrated this so-called random uh, metal material, or uh, radiative cooling material, there are a lot of efforts uh, in making other materials. And I highlight here a few other materials being made. And one of them actually is Yang Fu is the panelist here. They made the paint using PVDF and HFP. It's Polo's paint. And then the second paper was done actually by us and uh, our colleagues in University of Maryland making wood as a cooling material. And the third one is actually made by uh, Evelyn Wan's group on PEL gel. In other words, there are a lot of efforts in making these radiative cooling materials. Many of them try to address other functions of this, this uh, functionality. In other words, how to use them, right? Easier to apply it on a surface or making a structural material or try to make them on windows, for example. But if you see these pictures, you find out most of them are gray and white. The word, I think, would be very boring if you see all white color. So over the past couple of years, there are also efforts in making colorful radiative cooling material. And this particular material being made by Young is trying to make paint with color, and apparently to make color have to have visible absorption. And these are the material they made. And this is the one material we made, actually is a coating. And you can see there we can have different colors. And uh, you see the concrete, we apply on concrete, the temperature difference on the concrete is about 20 degrees C. Okay. So those materials have been made. And uh, as far as I can tell, it's about 200, different papers are making or just measuring different materials on radiative cooling uh, properties. Some has pretty good properties, some not, and some just feel they have something looks interesting to publish a paper. Now, we look into what are the potential applications of these uh, materials, and it was exciting to look into, say, buildings, right? Building energy consumption, and we look into, say, storages, right? Storage chemicals, food, or even wines, for example. Then, then we also look into, say, agriculture, how, how they can change the, the modern agriculture, right? And cold chains, right? and PV cells. We look into different application areas, and I feel reasonably exciting to share with you some of our studies over the last few years in terms of these applications. Okay, the first one is definitely looking to the roof because you either paint or coating or just the film. You can think about applying on the roof. And this particular picture shows two model roofs, uh, two model rooms we built in Wyoming about 2017 or so. And one is just regular single roof and one is metal roof. And inside the room we show here, 11 degree C temperature difference. On the bottom left corner, you see a picture layer, and you see here is really roof induced air conditioning electricity. In other words, usual roofs use positive electricity, and only using our metal, metal material roof is inactive electricity. It means it's cooling down. Okay, it's cooling down the roof. Now, this figure actually is done by David Seller, okay, who is a panelist today. And he looks into the single family house if we apply this kind of super cool rules and how the energy consumption is going to be different in comparison with typical white roof or typical cool roof. And you can see that they are pretty significant uh, energy savings if we apply laws as a roof. Okay, now unfortunately, the roof, you 
if we, you apply it, you have to think about how to stop it in the winter, in the cold days, right? And uh, there are certain regions definitely you do need to stop, but there are regions, for example, in New York, you have to stop it during the winter. Now, you can think about other way, you know, try to look into materials or look into mechanical systems. And this particular slide shows you if we use mechanical system. And uh, this is through so-called active circulation. You can actively circulate air or you can actively circulate water to cool it, right? We circulate air and we try to cool attic, right? And this attic, actually, this is really normal house, single family house in, in North America, indeed, right? And we show that if we can use this to cool attic, it can save your know, air conditional energy use. But in the meantime, this figure here, we pose an interesting question, is how thick could be the insulation layer for the attic? In other words, if you see the picture on the right bottom corner, you will see if the insulation is too thick, then the game might not be as much. But if insulation is thin, you would have a lot of gain. And this means if we try to look into best use of this material, we might need to open our eyes in terms of design. Okay, so those are about building energy consumption. And I think we also have a lot of other places we just do not look into, say, energy consumption, but just look into temperature reduction. And this particular picture shows an airport gangway actually in Southeast Asia. And we try to apply this material on it. And you see here, the temperature difference on top of the surface is actually pretty remarkable. It's about 25 degrees C to 30 degrees C. Inside the gangway, the temperature reduction is about eight degrees C. And the bottom part actually is like a cargo container. And a lot of people interested in making this cargo container as a, a house, for example, for, for just, just quick use of the house, right? And you see the temperature reduction is about eight to 10 degrees C. In other words, they can be used in a lot of places you do not have air conditioners or it's not convenient to, to use air conditioners. And actually it's interesting today because of this COVID-19, people are thinking about shutting off central air conditioners. And if you can use those materials, it could be exciting. And those are building part. Now, there are heat, open heat island effect, and this is reasonably well known because we know in a city, in a downtown, we have higher temperature than the rural area because of human activities, because of the building structures there. Okay, now there is an interesting fact. And that's for US city with a population larger than 10,000 people, the peak electricity load will increase about 1.5 to 2% for every one degree F increase in temperature. Now, if you look at the left top corner, you see the temperature difference for downtown and for rural area is about five to seven degree. Right? It's pretty big. Now, we actually put some efforts in this. You see on, on the right picture, we put our material on a concrete surface, actually on a roof surface, and you see a big temperature change. Okay, the surface temperature change is 20 some degree. And if you can think of a coating of the city infrastructures, for example, any sports field or, or the load, you can change really the temperature of the downtown. And uh, you do not need to damp as much heat from your air conditioners. That's something we feel pretty exciting, pretty interesting to look into. It. And that's why we also have uh, Professor David Saylor here today because he knows how to do those engineers. And the other thing I think uh, we can look into is really look into how this cold temperature due to the utilization of the cold universe can bring us to. 
And one example actually is looking to power plants, thermal power plants. And the thermal power plants, the interesting fact is we know that a three, d, a three degree rise in steam condensation temperature actually changes the power production efficiency by 1%. And that's a huge number. That's a huge number. In the meantime, in the meantime, actually water use is becoming a challenge for thermal power plants today, okay? In US, for example, EPA is trying to give troubles to power plant owners or builders in terms of water use. In particular, 3% of cooling water actually is evaporated, it's gone. And this gives you a trouble especially in terms of water use for power plants and for agriculture. Now we look into say the potential, the potential in terms of changing this is in other words, whether we can try to use this radiative cooling for power plants. And uh, we try to build something called hybrid radiative evaporative cooling. And uh, the diagram is showing in the left bottom corner, basically try to show how we can make it work. Okay, the important picture is showing on the right hand side, basically shows if we do not, if we do not look at, say, efficiency penalty. In other words, we can save a lot of water. Okay, if, if we look into this, we can save actually 30 to 90 percent of annual annual water without penalty if we use hybrid radiative evaporative cooling. Now in the meantime, if we just want to use radiative cooling as a dry cooler, it definitely have certain uh, penalty in terms of efficiency. And we calculate it's about 0.7 percentage. It's really reasonable in comparison with just regular dry cooling approach. This is something I think uh, it's interesting in terms of power pro pro uh, production. And if we look into another picture, it's showing how we can tape something we never thought about it. And today, a lot of people are thinking about using so-called wearables, right? And the wearable thermoelectric generator actually is one of the interesting idea to many people because you can wear a thermoelectric device. By the way, that's my PhD thesis work similar things like thermoelectrics. And if you, you, you make thermoelectric generators and use human body as heat resources, and you can run, right? You can, you can go outside and run, right? And uh, it's, it's, it, it can run sensors. Now, unfortunately, any time you have thermoelectric generators and you wear like what I show here in the picture, there's no heat sink during the daytime because the sun shed a lot of energy on top of that and make it hot, okay? And in other words, on the picture, you see almost a very low power production, power generation during daytime. But if you use radiative cooling material, you can make a good power generation on the daytime, okay? That's one thing to look into, say, really change the heat sink. Actually following about a similar uh, line as what I mentioned in last scale. But in the meantime, I show you an exciting result. And that's something people usually don't think is during the cold night or during the night and how you can tape the energy resources, right? Of course, you have a lot of different options in the night, but in this particular efforts is done by Stanford group, it's the San Francisco group is trying to yield use night sky and to produce power through thermoelectrics. The exciting result is they make thermoelectric devices and face to the night sky, they are able to, they are able to light LED, okay? The energy density is pretty low indeed. However, however, the point I want to make is this gives you an imagination, say how to tape something you never thought before is tapping a cool sky and try to make it lighting, okay, generating electricity there. Now there are other efforts we can think 
is really try to make use of this material, especially thinking about the very cold temperature, the temperature lower, even lower than ambient temperature, right? And I show here something I think uh, it's interesting. One is you look into the tents, right? We have about 15 degrees C temperature difference comparing radiative cooling material to just regular red light tents, right? And this picture basically showing under umbrella, right? And uh, the golfers having an umbrella made of radiative cooling material, you see a degree C temperature difference there, right? And you can make fun of those. You can make really just uh, a clothes for dogs. And you see there, the temperature reduction is pretty big. And with that, I think I will close what I wanted to talk. Really, I talked about building energy uh, consumption reduction, and we can think about using this for mitigating urban heat island effect, and also temperature reduction for personal activities and so on. And something I didn't touch really is you can think about how to reduce uh, heat in agriculture, in, in greenhouse, or even capture water. With that, I think I will, I will turn, turn my screen back to uh, to Xiaomi. Professor Xiaomi, you can go ahead. I don't know how to stop share. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Yang, for a great, very inspiring talk. It was very exciting. All right, so let me just uh, share my screen and move on. Before I move on, I would like to um, make one announcement. Um, Professor Ongwe Yan has recently received a uh, Nukiyama Memorial Award. Professor, this award was named after uh, Professor Nukiyama, who is very well known for boiling heat transfer. So we would like to congratulate Professor Ongwe Yan for this award. Thank you. Okay, so let me just also uh, remind you about the agenda. Um, now, uh, maybe some of the announcements might have said this colloquium is for one hour, but uh, what we planned is one and a half hours. So if it was 10 o'clock when it started, we're going to go until 1130. We'll probably try to finish a little bit before that, um, but uh, hopefully you would understand it and uh, join us for further discussion. Thank you. All right, with that, um, I would like to um, do the intermission poll one. And this is the poll. Let me start off the poll. So the question is, which area app or application can radiative cooling have the biggest impact on? A, mitigating the urban heat island effect and cooling, cooling the earth. B, reducing air conditioning energy use. C, personal comfort for outdoor activities. D, sustainable agriculture by reducing heat and water harvesting. And E, power plant dry cooling. All right, so I'm gonna wait until roughly 80% of the people vote. And meanwhile, this is also a good timing for you to uh, ask questions. As I said, um, please use the Q&A function and ask questions to the panelists. We'll be picking the questions to ask the panelists from the list of questions that you sent us. Okay, and again, um, the default is that we'll be calling your name but if you want to stay anonymous, please state so when you ask question. All right, okay, now the number is going up. Okay, let's give a little more time, maybe 20 more seconds to go so that I can share the result with you. Okay. All right, we're also getting a lot of questions now. Please ask questions because the question is very important element of this colloquium. Thank you very much. 
Thank you, thank you. Okay, now it's reaching 75%. So let me share their result with you. Here's the result. So 50% of people voted for reducing air conditioned energy use and 28% was on mitigating the urban heat island effect and cooling the earth. It's very interesting. And then, um, yeah, some, some people also voted for the rest of the three. Oh, sorry, I, I should, sorry, maybe I didn't uh, share it with you. So this is how it looks now. Let me repeat that. Half the people voted for reducing air conditioned energy use. Okay, this is very interesting. Okay, so with that, we would like to move on to the panel discussion. Now, just to start off the panel discussion. Um, so, Dave and Yuan, do you hear me? Uh, yes, I can hear you. Okay, very nice. Dave, how, yeah. how about you? Okay, yeah, very nice. So, to start off, um, we just would like to ask you, what are the open questions or scientific challenges to be addressed in this field? Or what are your uh, perspective or outlook in the field from your viewpoint? Maybe we can start by asking Dave. Um, sure. And then you can spend about two or three minutes to address your perspective. Thank you. All right. So, so my perspective is, is maybe a, a bit different and much more applied than many people on the call here. Uh, so my background is also mechanical engineering with a focus on heat transfer and fluid mechanics. Uh, but my research is really very applied with a focus on interactions between buildings and the urban climate system. So obviously I found this presentation uh, quite uh, exciting. Um, and also thank you again for having me on as a panelist. Um, but, uh, you know, so I've been looking and my group has been looking at, at this question of urban heat islands and, and really the causes effects and the potential for mitigation of extreme heat in cities uh, for quite some time now. And, and you know, one of the, the traditional uh, uh, approaches is to simply use very highly reflective materials. And you know, in historical context, very highly reflective means simply white, like you know, uh, TPO membrane, you know, membrane roofs that are white that maybe reflect something like 80 to 85% of the solar radiation when they're, when they're new and over time they age. Um, and so with the, the um, PDRC materials, which are, you know, sort of, if you wish, you know, white, you know, or cool coatings on steroids with extremely high solar reflectance and extremely high thermal emittance, um, the, you know, there, there are several important considerations that uh, I, I think, uh, you know, Rongwei uh, alluded to uh, that apply both to sort of traditional cool roofs, but also to these PDRC materials. First of all, that would be applications on sloped roofs are limited. Uh, and I, th I think there was a question about uh, paving surfaces as well that I saw as I was scrolling through the questions. And so one of the challenges with any of these highly reflective surfaces is that they reflect that energy somewhere. And so if, you're, if you have a sloped roof or a pavement, a lot of that shortwave reflect, you know, reflected radiation is reflected into other buildings and windows are quite transmissive to shortwave energy, not so much for long wave. And, and so you know, the sloped roofs is one challenge that I think we, we face. Uh, also, as Rongwei, uh, you know, mentioned, the wintertime heating penalty is a huge concern. And with the conventional white roof uh, strategies that we've been exploring for decades, uh, it's generally found that throughout at least most of the climate zones in the U.S., uh, there's a net benefit or, or essentially a trade-off in terms of going with a highly reflective versus a conventional darker roof uh, in terms of air conditioning savings versus, versus heating penalties. Um, However, you know, the, the, the more reflective roofs have less thermal cycling, so they tend to last longer. So in general, across most uh, application climate zones, the, the higher reflective roofs are generally a, a good thing. Uh, but again, we do have to worry about or think about that wintertime penalty. And then of course, uh, performance after weathering and you know, UV uh, state, you know, stability. Uh, and certainly with, with white roofs, you know, they start out and I've, I've been on many many rooftops and, and, and made these these measurements 
you know, they start off with a solar reflectance of 80, 85%, and within a year, they're down to 70%. Uh, and so uh, dealing with the long-term performances is, is an issue. Um, nevertheless, I would say that, you know, these PDRC materials are really a game changer compared with the conventional white surfaces. Uh, and I say this because uh, passive daytime radiative cooling technologies, you know, at, as was shown, can maintain the surfaces below ambient air temperature under all conditions at all times. And so instead of simply trying to slow the transfer of heat from hot urban surfaces to the surrounding air, which affects the urban heat island effect, right? Um, PDRC surfaces actually have the potential to reverse the direction of heat transfer. So I think of these as really having an opportunity to act as, I would even call them passive radiative heat pump surfaces where right. you're actively, well, not, I guess passively, but you're continuously removing heat from the urban air shed and putting it out uh, through the, the long wave uh, uh, radiative window in, uh, mostly into space. So um, I think it's a very you know, interesting topic area. My, my expertise as it relates to this is again, much more on the application side. We use a lot of building energy modeling and atmospheric modeling to really quantify the magnitude of the cooling effect and explore how these materials can reduce air conditioning demand. So those are my two focus areas. And so I was very pleased to see that the poll showed that, that many people are interested in that as well. Um, and of course, that was the, the, uh, you know, the motivation for a lot of the work that I've done on these, these materials. I've done nothing in terms of the sort of the technology themselves or the development of, of technology, but really uh, asking the questions, if you can develop and deploy cost-effective technologies, how will they perform? How will they affect energy consumption and the urban climate? Uh, so needless to say, you know, many in my field are very excited about this. Uh, and in addition to some of the simulation work we're doing, we're actually getting industry and local government partners that are interested in uh, deploying demonstration projects, which I think is a really key element in the R&D loop to, to help facilitate you know, the, the long-term success of the technology. So I'll, I'll leave it there. And Thank you very much, Dave. Yuan. Okay. How about you? Yeah, so uh, first I want to thank Rongrui for the excellent talk. So it really show us lots of, of potential markets and the diversity of possible applications. I feel very excited. And also it's great to see uh, lots of new data. And uh, also uh, I agree with David uh, on lots of uh, perspectives like uh, uh, so the cost and uh, uh, say the comparison with the conventional uh, white paint. Uh, so uh, I have worked uh, in the field since roughly 2016. So and uh, I basically try, uh, focus on the paint approach. So directly uh, something that like white uh, PDRC coating that can be directly applied to uh, buildings. Uh, so uh, I think my perspective is into two parts. So one is on the scientific part, like uh, the question is what's the, uh, uh, so how to achieve the optimal uh, reflectance spectrum. So, uh, for example, for the white paint, so uh, we want high emittance of, uh, in the uh, long wavelength infrared a window from 8 to 13 micrometer. So that's actually not that uh, difficult, but how to make other infrared wavelengths uh, zero emittance, like 5 to 8 and uh, beyond 13, that's actually quite hard. And also, uh, on the other side, so uh, we are working on the uh, colored uh, cooling paint. That's basically to reflect uh, the uh, infrared light uh, in the solar spectrum and how to achieve like, for example, 100% reflectance in the uh, uh, infrared part of the solar flux while keep uh, the color you want in the visible part. I think that's also a quite challenging uh, problem. And also if you, want to uh, uh, reflect uh, the uh, infrared. And there's also 7% of energy in the uh, UV light in sunlight. So how to achieve high reflectance in both UV and uh, uh, infrared and by keep the visible uh, uh, maintain certain color. I think that's also not an easy question uh, to address. So those are on the scientific part. And uh, for the real application, I think uh, since uh, this is like a, 
uh, application oriented. So really, why the, the considerations in application uh, is really very, very important and we should keep that in mind. So when we do research, so for example, like David said, the cost. Uh, and uh, also I think for buildings, so the thermal insulation is also uh, widely used as uh, uh, Aron uh, talked the last time. So then if there is very uh, stage uh, insulation, so how will this affect uh, the performance of radiative cooling? So that's also something to look at. And also like the durability. Uh, I think uh, based on approach, uh, the different approaches in the field, so it seems that uh, uh, it may be able to last longer for the conventional acrylic paint. So because acrylic paint so, uh, can degrade under the UV light and uh, like the uh, fluoropolymer I use and also the dietetic approach uh, Rongrui is using. Uh, it seems that from the material aspect, it could last uh, for a longer time. So, uh, so far I haven't seen any uh, analysis taken the durability into account. So on the e economic uh, beneficial. And I think uh, with that taken account, so it really can help the field to understand uh, what are the really uh, benefits of what are the economic gains. So for example, when I talk with industry, so the, they always ask, so what's the uh, overall uh, economic uh, benefits? Because that's really uh, determined whether it can be used or not. I don't know also many other markets that's actually maybe not as sensitive to the cost, and I feel that's very exciting here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, June, I think you need to unmute yourself. Thank you very much, Wen. Right, so uh, we, we're getting a lot of questions uh, concerning durability, as you mentioned, and also cost. And um, you have kind of uh, with uh, you have uh, answered some of the questions already. Rongue, do you want to add anything yeah, to the I think, uh, issue? I think let's 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 uh, a lot of people are have been asking about this, and uh, indeed, indeed, in terms of durability or reliability. Uh, we are able to engineer the material and uh, to get into a lifetime or at least the function doesn't lose for about 10 years, either on the coatings, on the paint or on the films. And uh, you, you, you can learn a lot through different aspects in terms of this polymer or materials engineering. There are lots of those can be used and we are able to, to get them to be longer than that. Now, the other thing is, uh, I think I, I look at the questions, a lot of people are asking about, say, windows. And windows, you can look into a couple of possibilities. One is you can use really like what I just mentioned, mechanical ways, mechanical shuttles, for example. And uh, you know, mechanical shuttle or the circulation, you can stop the circulation of air or water. And the other thing is uh, you can, think about to say more fancy way is how the material can be changed. Now, of course, I think the best, most economic way would be in the lowest climate zones like, uh, like Arizona or Los Angeles or Southeast Asia, they always need cooling. And those applications, some, some of those applications always need cooling. So there are certain ways to go around it. Right. Anything else to add? Dave, Yuan? Okay. So let me just uh, also uh, pick up the question from another angle. Um, this is from anonymous attendee. What is the theoretical limit of radiative cooling in terms of cooling power? Would we ever, would we ever be able to achieve values to enable refrigeration? So, so if anybody look into a paper actually by Professor Xianghui, a French group, and uh, they show that they can uh, reach negative 40 degrees C temperature. And it really depends on how you insulate the whole system, right? If you look into really the sky, right? Ideal sky is uh, 3K. Now, really in, in between, it's, uh, it's different. Real sky temperature you see can be higher than that, but I think uh, negative, 40, 50 can be done. And then the end of the question is, is it a scientific, 
experiment or it's an engineering experiment. And that's a balance there. Go ahead. Innocent. Uh, yeah, actually, uh, when I hear the questions, the first thing coming to my mind is uh, Professor Shang Hui Fan's paper on using vacuum to achieve really low temperature as Rong Rui said, it's 40 degrees Celsius cooler than the environment. Uh, and another way to uh, look at this problem is that what's the ultimate uh, uh, cooling power the surface can achieve. So I think that's like a 100% reflectance of all, all sunlight and uh, like uh, the, and then the cooling power is the uh, uh, radiation power in the long wavelengths infrared window. Uh, that's, I think, the number, of course, the number depends on the atmospheric condition. For example, if there's lots of moisture inside or not. So in a dry condition, so typically, I think it's like 150, or uh, maybe at most 200 watt per meter square. So uh, the sun power is 1,000 watt per meter square. So for 20% of solar cell, the uh, electricity production is 200 watt per meter square. So of course, cooling power, I would say people think the quality, they, I mean, the uh, energy quality of thermal is less than uh, electricity, but uh, 150 to 200 watt per meter square is still something I think very appreciable, yeah. Okay, thanks. All right, uh, here's next one is a little bit of a curveball. Um, if a shade were put over a single roof, how would temperature in the room compare with the metamaterial roof? So how, if, if I, Wang Wei, I think you need to unmute yourself. Yeah. What, what, if, what, if, if, a, uh -huh. if, if a shade were put over a single roof, how would temperature in the room compare with the metamaterial case? Or maybe Dave, I, um, either I, of you. I, I, I think one, one other picture we show is on this metamaterial roof, you can have active, active cooling, okay? Like, that's a picture I show like, you comparing to all other roofs, right? The best you can get is say, the temperature similar to the environment. Now, with metamaterial, you can pump the heat out from the room, so you can have lower. And, and I, would, I would just add that, uh, you know, shading a roof not only shades it from the direct and, and diffuse solar radiation, but it shades it from the outgoing uh, long wave exchange. And so you know, we've done studies even looking at photovoltaics on rooftops where you can show that, that there's a trade-off between the benefit of the, you know, the, P, the PV shading the roof uh, from solar gains during the day, but then inhibiting the long wave losses at night such that it actually can increase the total air conditioning demand uh, for some buildings uh, to, to have a, a photovoltaic shade surface on top of it. Go ahead. Good. I, I don't have much to add yeah, right. on, on this point. I agree with David and Lundgren. Yeah. The other question that a lot of people are asking, uh, including uh, Ji John, is how far is it to commercialize these radiation cooling materials? So how is it going with the commercialization? Maybe uh, Rongo is the person. I think. Uh, I think. Uh, yeah. I think uh, we we have pretty good efforts on that. Um, on one hand, as I mentioned, you can look into say some applications which doesn't go too much into just building energy consumption, for example. One. That's one part. Uh, using just temperature reduction, and the other part is building energy consumption. And as I mentioned, we can demonstrate. It's about 10 year lifetime, and you can calculate it, see how much is the uh, energy saving, and uh, it's, it's usually, it can be just uh, uh, a payback period of three or four years, three years usually, and uh, the commercialization actually goes reasonably well. And uh, as I show you here, there is a J airport gangway layer. We applied it and uh, you see the bigger difference. Okay, thank you. I know, I know Yang also, also have a, a commercialization effort on that. Uh, actually, we have licensed uh, our patent on the paint to a startup company. 
So yeah, and uh, I uh, so there actually was a Nature newspaper. Uh, I think on the last day of last year. So that's actually is a perspective on the status of radiative cooling. So and it actually talked about the commercialization efforts by different teams uh, in US and all over the world. Okay, yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, um, we have a little more time. I hope everybody agrees that I can go on a little bit more with the questions. Is it okay for the panelists? Okay, of thanks. Course. So maybe this one is for Dave. Um, anonymous attendee again. A lot of people are now turning it anonymous. <laughs> I'm curious about the trade-offs of putting solar panels on roofs versus adding different coatings to enhance thermal characteristics of buildings. What are the trade-offs in terms of energy and cost and which is better? Yeah, yeah. So, so uh, like I sort of alluded to in my last response, um, you know, the you know when you put a photovoltaics on a roof, you know, maybe you get eighteen or twenty percent efficient panels, and you know, so you're you're generating a lot of electricity, which is is definitely a good thing. Um, in some applications, uh, it can actually costs a little bit extra in terms of air conditioning demand on the building. Even though you're shading it from the sun, you're, you're not allowing it to cool at night. And so we found that, that of the energy generated um, by, uh, by the panels, you might have a penalty of like 5% of that energy has to go into the additional air conditioning. Um, so it, it, it's really, it's, it's maybe not an either or. I think there are, there are applications where where you know you would want to do one versus the other. Um, certainly, different types of buildings perform or you know have a, have more advantage for different types of technologies, residential versus commercial in particular, um, slope roofs versus flat roofs. So you know, obviously, on a slope roof, the PV would be uh, in general a better choice, I think, um, unless you start developing these PDRC materials that are selective in the in the um, in the visible spectrum, um, but even then, you know, you know, the the comment I made earlier about the reflection. So, it, it it's yeah, it's hard to really say that that one is is better. I think they have different applications. Uh, in certain, one thing I, I do want to add though is that the the performance for the building depends very much on the insulation level. And I, I think Rong Wei had a a slide where he showed in Phoenix. You know, I don't know if it's like an R R eleven rooftop or an R nineteen and R thirty. Um, most modern rooftops are mandated to have much higher uh, uh, insulation levels, particularly in city, cities like Phoenix. So the 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 more insulation you have, the less thermal coupling there is between the roof surface and the building. And so the PDRC materials are still very effective in terms of their management of the energy budget. But what they're doing is they're having more of an effect on cooling the air than cooling the building uh, as they're more thermally de decoupled. So it depends, you know, if you're interested in cooling the urban heat island, you know, yeah, the, the photovoltaics also actually heat, heat the city. So um, overall, you know, the PDRCs would be much better for, for urban cooling. Yeah, I, I, I actually, I share, I share exactly the same view. It really depends on what's the geographical location. And the think about actually these PDRCs, essentially you have 24 hours continuous running, right? And the light actually compared to six to eight hours actually lack compensates, say in terms of efficiency. Now, now one comment I, I didn't talk earlier, what, was really say when you try to utilize solar energy right now the best photovoltaic trying to trap as much as possible and that heats up uh, the earth quite a bit uh yeah i just uh want to add a little bit so i think there is also there are also studies try, trying to combine pdrc and uh, solar cells for example to enhance the uh, thermal emittance uh, of the solar cell surface that uh, can uh, cool things that reduce the thermal load and which also can increase the efficiency of solar cells. Thank you very much. I, I know you guys addressed this already, but there are, there are still a lot of questions concerning uh, humidity and smog and so on. 
I think uh, the people want to know what what is the influence of sort of a, a practical environmental, um, yeah, environments when there's in the hum humid locations and also when there's smog or do you want to add something to that, uh, Rongue? Ye yes, I mean definitely the best sky would be Arizona and Boulder, as I mentioned. And the land, if you look into, look into Hong Kong, it's, it's a little bit more humid and uh, it changes uh, a bit. I think, uh, I believe the same material performs about, about say 10 degrees C temperature difference in Boulder, it could end up with seven degrees C difference in Hong Kong. And uh, we actually, in, in our job paper, we did a reasonably, quant reasonably well quantitative analysis in terms of how much you look into the cloud. The cloud, basically how much percent of the cloud, in terms of cloud structures, you say, very scattered cloud, or the first sky of really dark sky layer, and uh, we see the difference there. Right. And uh, definitely, if if it's a cloudy day, most of the time it's not as hot. But if it's humid, then it's different. It's 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 interesting indeed, and uh, and uh, and a challenge to study, to be honest. Yeah, I, I I would just add that uh, in the context of just conventional white roofs or cool roofs, we've done a lot of modeling work, you know, to, to try to answer the question by how much can you cool a city. And so we do a lot of regional scale atmospheric modeling. And depending upon the, the heat episode that you, you choose to study, if it happens to be a more overcast period, you have very little effect of, you know, the, the, you know obviously the solar reflectance of the surfaces don't matter as much because you have a, more of a synoptic heat wave hitting you. And so we, you know, we do see you know, a very strong connection there. You know, so you have the most benefit under hot, uh, somewhat static, um, uh, you know, high pressure um, heat wave scenarios. Yeah, the same conclusion here. So we have done uh, some comparison between uh, Phoenix, Arizona and uh, Chittagong, Bangladesh. So that's uh, near uh, uh, India. So the, at uh, Arizona, we get six degrees Celsius subambient cooling, and in Chittagong, it's like three degrees Celsius. So basically, uh, from very dry to very humid, like uh, I think th about three degrees Celsius uh, difference. Yeah. All right, thank you very much. So I think with that, um, I would like to close the uh, panel discussion, if the panelists agree. Okay, yeah. we're still getting more than 100. We're getting more than 100 uh, questions, and I. I'm very sorry that we cannot accommodate all the questions, but the ones that we couldn't today is going to be posted on um, on YouTube together with the presentation. And by the way, uh, the last presentation by Professor Arim Majumda is already posted on YouTube. So if you're interested, please go ahead and, and then look at it. So with that, I would like to um, do the, um, I'm sorry. This, the second poll, second poll I promised. Uh, hold on. Now we move on to the wrap up. Okay, so now the second poll turns out to be the same poll as the first poll. We just would like to hear your opinion again on the same question and see how you changed or continue to think about this question. All right, so. Um, hold on. Okay, so please vote on the same question. Which area application can radiative cooling have the biggest impact on? A, mitigating the urban heat island effect and cooling the earth. B, reducing air condition energy use. C, personal comfort for outdoor activities. D, sustainable agriculture, E, the power plant dry cooling. Okay, now we have 60% of people who voted. It's reaching 67, 68, 70%, a little more to go.
Okay, thank you, thank you. So now it has reached 75%, so I'm gonna close the poll now for in five seconds. All right, so let me share the result with you. So, <laughs> it's 50% reducing their air conditioning energy use and 31% mitigating their urban heat island effect. So, mitigating urban heat island increased from 25% to 31%. Dave, maybe um, you have convinced a couple of people there. All right. So, that was interesting. Thank you very much. With that, um, I want to start um, the wrap up. So before wrapping up the colloquium, I would like to make an announcement for the next colloquium is the same time next week. The topic will be high temperature thermal energy storage and the presenter will be the professor Robert Laughlin. As you know, the Nobel laureate from Stanford University. So please, again, join the organizers for this colloquium. So, um, to wrap up, uh, first of all, um, please make, okay, please type in your suggestions on topics. We will, because we will construct a poll based on these suggestions next time. So, we will close this colloquium in about five minutes, but we'll keep the broadcasting open for another five minutes so that you can type your suggestions to the Q&A um, on the topic you're interested in. So again, please type in your suggestions on the topics that you would like to hear within this colloquium. And then organizers will compile it and make a poll next time to choose whether which one is most popular and so on. You're also encouraged to sign up on email list uh, for the colloquium. You will get uh, information about the colloquium once you sign up, please do so. And as Evelyn mentioned in the beginning of this colloquium, after June 3rd, this colloquium will be given every other week, bi-weekly webinar, okay? And uh, so we're about to finish, but I would like to thank people who contributed to the webinar today. Thank you, Keke, thank you, Simo, thank you, James, thank you, Xiaotin, and all the other students who helped us organizing. 